And today I'm going to read from Acts 13, verses 13 through 52. John gave me a very long one. Uh, <laughs> Paul and Barnabas at Antioch in Pisidia. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law of the prophets, law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave, their land, gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who, is, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, what do you suppose that I, who, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he, no, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. <clears throat> Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. Whoop. <laughs> and though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another Psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you therefore, brothers, that through this man, <clears throat> the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, there, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astonished and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them continue to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. 
since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying, glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing, and the leading men of the city stirred up in persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them, and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, that was a long one, wasn't it? <laughs> see. If you would, just again, please join me in prayer. Father, I thank you for the privilege to serve you and your people whom you have called together. Now grant that I decrease, that you might increase, that I not speak, but rather you speak through me for your purposes and for your glory. Open our eyes and our ears, our hearts and our minds, so that at the end of this message, we will have come to see you more clearly, to love you more dearly, and we will have chosen to follow you more nearly. This is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, a long one. Thank you again, Carol. And thank you for being here today. My name is not Tom Hansen. Tom, Sarah, and the kids, as you heard, are away. And we pray traveling mercies upon them as they go out and as they return. My name is John Lanuza. I am an elder here at Grace Church, together with uh, Chad. And I am further proof that you do not have to be qualified for God to call you into his service. All you have to do is say yes. And today, we're going to talk about encouragement. Right? Um, it came very early in that very long scripture passage when the rulers of the synagogue asked Paul and Barnabas, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what it is, why we need it, where to find it. We're going to talk a little bit about what genuine encouragement is and how people might respond. We're going to learn a little bit from the people that are cited in the passage. We'll look at examples of uh, distraction and derailment. I'm going to use these today. I think Tom used alliterations last week, right? Uh, to reach the religious, right? To uh, something about the earth. Anyway, I'm going to use alliterations as well. We're going to talk about distraction and derailment. We're going to talk about delight and deliverance. And we're going to talk about determination, but not discouragement. And then we'll see how we develop the ability to respond properly. Now, for all of these questions we're going to ask and answer, spoiler alert, the end of it all, the answer is Jesus. Right? So that's kind of like giving you the answers to the test at the beginning. Let's put some context into this. Now, we're pretty sure that Luke wrote the book of Acts. Right? which is a sort of a sequel, a second volume to his gospel. In Acts, Luke had four objectives. He wanted to present the history of the church. He wanted to defend the gospel from attack by both Jew and Gentile because he wanted to be able to find converts to the church. Right? He wanted to provide a guide for the future church and most importantly in the context of our message today, he wanted to depict the triumph of Christianity in the face of bitter persecution. So, let's go back to where we are. In obedience to the Great Commission, Paul and Barnabas have just traveled about 150 miles from Pamphylia, which is now Side, on the Turkish coast of the Mediterranean. I imagine the beach there must look pretty nice. Northwards to Antioch of Pisidia which is now called Yalvak. It's in Turkey as well. 150 miles. Think about that for a second. They, they walked that, right? So 
That's about here to the outskirts of Boston, if I'm not mistaken. That Great Commission was not easy. <laughs> so, uh, Pisidia is a Roman colony with a big Jewish presence, and it's got a synagogue, which is where Paul and Barnabas go, and is where we catch up with them. Now, today's scripture reading, it's the Sabbath, and the Jewish leaders, having just finished the reading of God's word, turn to Paul and Barnabas to ask for a word of encouragement. What is encouragement? Let's answer that question really quickly. It comes from the French word, and I apologize for butchering the pronunciation, encourager, which has two parts, en, which is to make or to put in, and corriger, which means courage or heart to which I might add hope. And so, with your permission, I will build my own definition. A word of encouragement is a word to give people the courage, the heart, and the hope to keep going, to persist in the face of opposition and obstacle, along a path and towards an objective. Okay, very important. The persistence amidst obstacles, along a path, a long way towards a life, towards an objective. Now that we know what it is, the question then is, why do we need these words to keep us going? Well, we need them because we have goals. We have aspirations, right? We try to do good. We would like to live good lives. We would like to arrive at a good ending. And yet, there are obstacles in opposition. We hit brick walls. We run into seemingly immovable objects. And these can be terribly frustrating. And we can be tempted to give up. Giving up on a good objective can be a terrible thing. You know, I've seen it, right? Some people, they give up. They just, they, they just stop functioning. I've seen people just closet themselves in their rooms. The light's out unwilling to engage, right? I've seen that happen. They stop trying to find work. They stop working on relationships. They cease to be spouses, parents, children, colleagues, productive members of society. And when that happens, what is a bad situation deteriorates to even worse. Some people take it even further. You know, this is a, some of you have heard this story, but in the last five years, I've had two dear friends fall into such despair they took their own lives. Now, I can't speak to where they are today. And I hope that somehow they would have known Jesus some way, right? But I did see the tragedy that followed their actions and the effect it had on the people they loved the most. Despair, discouragement, their effects, they're very real. So yeah, we need encouragement. You know, Scripture cites as much, right? In Hebrews, Paul instructs us to exhort one another every day, so long as it is today, that none of us may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So Paul recognizes the need for exhortation. In 1 Thessalonians, he talks again about the inevitability of sudden destruction, which people cannot escape. And in anticipation of that, he admonishes us to encourage one another, to build one another up. Don't think Paul is enough of a reference? Jesus talks about encouragement too. Right? Jesus in John 16 warns of tough times, telling the disciples they would be scattered each to their own home. But he also gives encouragement. He says, I have said these things to you that in me, despite everything that's going on, you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Now, how's that for encouragement? Right? So, we know, Paul have said, has said as much, Jesus has said as much, that we need encouragement. The question is, where then do we find it? Right? And the world is a funny place because it tells us we can find this encouragement in ourselves. You've all had problems, right? And in the midst of those problems, you've had that really well-intentioned friend who came over and said, you'll be fine. You've got this. You know what to do. You know, it's nice to hear. And I wish it were true. But when you think it through, you realize that if you really did have this, 
you wouldn't be worried in the first place now, would you? <laughs> if you knew why you'd lost your job or where the next mortgage payment was going to come from, or if you knew why your marriage might be falling apart or why your kids were being so difficult, or perhaps why you'd, you know, you'd lived such a healthy life, why all of a sudden you were sick with something that you tried to avoid. Right? If you knew all of that, if you knew how to fix things, you would not be worried in the first place. So, let's admit it, we don't know. We don't know. And so, we don't got this. Right? We don't. So, we can't be our own encouragement. We don't have the answers. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, do we? We don't even know what's going to happen in the next moment. I mean, we can guess. And that's kind of all we do, right? When we talk about what's going to happen next, we're basically guessing based on what we knew happened in the past, right? Our knowledge of the past, though, is incomplete and imperfect. And so predicting the future based on what we little we know of the past is, and this occurred to me a while back, but it seems so true, seems like trying to drive a road on a road with your windshield blackened, trying to figure out the way to go by looking where you'd been through your side view mirrors. That is how we look at the future. That's how, that's how well we know the future. It just doesn't work. So the question then is, if we cannot turn to ourselves, how do we know what is right, what is true, what we aspire to, the life we want is good? How do we know all of that? Where do we find the encouragement? Whom can we trust to have all the answers? I'll take you back to the sort of the, the crib notes at the beginning, right? This is one of those questions you already know the answer to, but let's go through it anyway. Because if I was going to think of someone, if I was going to conceive of someone who had all these answers, whose encouragement I could trust, I could rely on, I would have a few requirements. First, I would want them, no, I would insist that they know everything. Everything. And not just knowledge, mind you. I would want them to have wisdom. I would want them to know not just what is, right? But the why as well. Not just what's going on, but the implications, right? No sense trusting someone whose knowledge and understanding was as imperfect as mine, right? They would have to be, for me to trust them, they would have to be omniscient. Now, there's more. This knowledge is pretty useless if they can't make things happen, right? And so they would have to have the power to make things happen, they would have to be powerful, no one more powerful. They would have to be able to work all things together for their purposes. They would have to be omnipotent. So omniscient, omnipotent, but wait, there's more. They would have to be everywhere, because I wouldn't want to be able to sneak around behind their back, nor would I want anybody else to, right? Difficult to trust someone completely if there were places they weren't or if there were times where they weren't present. If there were things that might happen outside their knowledge or if you couldn't count on them to be where you were at all times, they would have to be omnipresent. And underlying all of this, this presence, this power, this knowledge, right? In order for me to trust them, I would have to know that they loved me. Think about that. If they had all that power, all that presence, but you didn't know they loved you, why would you trust them? That they wanted what was best for me, even if it was at great cost to them. This love had to motivate their interactions with me. Tom gave me this word. I didn't actually know this word. They had to be omnibenevolent. I like that word. Now, just a question. Does anybody know someone like that? Does anyone know someone we can trust because they love us? Someone who knows for certain the right way to take, who knows for certain what is true and what isn't, and that the life we seek is the right one. Someone who hmm, might be the way, the truth, and the life. 
right? Because if we know someone like that, that is someone whose encouragement we can trust, whose encouragement is reason to keep going forward. Right? I'm blessed to have met that someone. His name is Jesus. And I believe that you have met him too, or you would not be here. Now, let's go further. We've talked about encouragement. We've kind of figured out why we need it and where it is we can find it. What now is this encouragement that Jesus offers? Right. Let's look at the Jewish equivalent of our salvation to answer that question. Let's start there. What did the Jews expect of a Messiah? They knew he was going to be a political person. He was going to be a king in the line of David. And that king was going to reestablish Israel as a country. You know, Pisidia, like Judea, was a Roman colony at this time, right? They did not have a king in the line of David at the moment. That king was supposed to kick out the Romans. He was going to kick out the Roman conquerors and reestablish the nation of Israel, and he was going to rebuild the temple. Now, looking at this, two things strike me. First, you know, the Jews had to make these sacrifices constantly, right, to make atonement. There's nothing in the idea of the Messiah that talks about atonement for man's sin. Now, it's not that the Jews didn't know what sin was and how it kept man at enmity with God and how atonement had to be made regularly in perpetuity. But their Messiah wasn't expected to pay the price for their sins. Did you notice that? <clears throat> he was a king, but he wasn't going to save them that way. The second thing that struck me <clears throat> is how little mention there is of life after death. The Jewish faith acknowledges the existence of a life after death, but says very little on the topic and instead focuses man's efforts on the earthly <coughs> rather than the eternal. Now, this is just me here, okay? But it seems to me the very thing that I want to be saved from isn't part of the job description. I want to be saved from the sin. I don't want to have to keep making the atonements. I, I don't want to have to deal with the scapegoat, right? But that, and more than that, I want to know that there is something after. I don't want to know that, I don't want to have to think that kind of life ends when life ends, right? Because if I started to think that way, it's a really short walk to eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. We know that's not the case. So now let's go back <clears throat> to Paul and Barnabas in the synagogue that first Sabbath. What is the encouragement they offer? It's a little different. Paul starts the encouragement with a brief excerpt of Jewish history. And from there, he then talks about the Messiah. But this Messiah is really different. right? It's different from the one the Jews had come to expect. Jesus was going to be of the line of David, but he preached an atonement for sin once for all, instead of the Jewish practice of regular atonement. And this Jesus was not a powerful political figure. He was an innocent man whom the Jewish authorities got the Romans to execute. But his authority was genuine. And how did they know? Because Jesus did what not even David, as mentioned in the passage, could not. Jesus rose from the dead. Think about that for a second. Jesus rose from the dead. This isn't like Lazarus, right? Because Lazarus didn't raise himself from the dead. Yeah, the Jews had seen somebody brought back to life, but they were brought back to life by somebody else. No, Jesus, this was all on him. He did this on his own. This is the Messiah that Paul is preaching. And so we get to the heart of Paul's encouragement in verse 38, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything, which is from all sin, which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Let's think about that for a second. That sin that separates us from God, that sin that we keep committing, raise your hand if you've got a persistent sin that you, can ne you can't seem to get rid of. Raise your hand if there's something you keep going back to. You say, you promise yourself you're never going to do again. 
but a sin that you keep committing. Raise your hand if you've got that. Raise your hand high so people can see. Well, the Jews, if you were in living, if you believed what the Jews did, every time you committed that sin, you would have to make atonement. But that's not the Jesus that Paul is preaching. That's not the Messiah that Paul preaches. The sin that separates us from God that we keep committing, that sin that persistently puts us in debt and demands atonement, guess what? It is finished. Tetelestai. We no longer have to wait for a Messiah. He has come. And we are saved. That is the message of encouragement that Paul preaches. Think about that for a second. That thing you're waiting for, it's here. You've got it. And it's even better than you thought it was going to be. Let's pause for a moment because we're going to change gears and we're going to now see how three different groups of people responded to this message. And we're going to learn from them, hopefully, right? The three different groups are the Jews, the Gentiles, and Paul and Barnabas. Let's start with the Jews. Their response was great at the start, right? But they then fell into distraction and derailment. Look at what they did. The first week, they received the encouragement Paul offers with great joy. They like it so much, they ask for seconds. <laughs> they ask Paul and Barnabas to speak again the following week. Right? But what happens the following week? They get distracted, right? Rather than look up at Paul and Barnabas and focus on what they have to say, they look around. And they see all of a sudden that almost the whole city has gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Right? They are derailed. They lose sight of the message Paul was preaching, which was salvation for everyone. Now, maybe it was because the salvation, the message they expected, was supposed to be just for them. So they didn't want to hear Jesus for everyone. Instead, they were selfish. The word we use is jealous, right? They wanted to hear Jesus for Jews only. Now, where do selfishness and distraction and derailment lead? Well, I'll tell you what, they don't lead to Jesus. No, it led them to forget the salvation. The salvation was being proclaimed right in front of them. And they looked away. Right? It led them to incite people, to stir up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, to drive away the messengers and their message of hope. This message of hope that they had so joyfully received just one week earlier. It's crazy. You know, I mean, if I were there, if you were there, you'd probably say, well, hold on a minute, hang on. Didn't you like what he said last week? Wasn't it a cause for joy? What's changed? Oh, you, you don't want to share. Right? It's really sad. Now, the thing is, we can learn from them, though. And here's a question. When we hear the good news, is there anything, any selfishness in us, any self-centeredness in us that might distract us from Jesus, that might cause us to look away? It's a question worth asking. Right? I leave it to you. Now, after the Jews, there's a second group. This is the group of the Gentiles, right? And their response, after the Jews rejected the encouragement, the good news, the, Paul, the salvation that Paul offered, Paul speaks boldly, right? He announces that he's taking the message of eternal life. You don't want it? Fine. I'm taking it to the Gentiles. And he declared to the Gentiles present that they, too, were part of God's salvation. How did they respond? They responded with delight. In verse 48, we read that when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the Lord, the word of the Lord. And with delight came deliverance. Because we read as well that as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. They received the word and they believed. They delighted in the word and they were delivered. Why were they delighted? Maybe because all this time they thought death was certain and inescapable. And now they are told that the Jesus who has conquered death and demonstrated his victory by rising from the grave, this Jesus offers them eternal life that the Messiah they thought they must have heard was for the Jews alone. That Messiah was for them too. That's really good news, isn't it? 
So yeah, so they embrace the message of encouragement and the message of salvation. But at the moment, let's take a pause here, right? It's nice. But at the moment, it is all salvation, sunshine, and roses, isn't it? Their faith has yet to be tested. So we have the first response, the first response of distraction and derailment, the second response of delight and deliverance. But is this as good as it gets? The answer, brothers and sisters, is no. It gets, you can, the response can get even better. And for the best response, we can look at the third group, which consists of just two people, Paul and Barnabas, right? Where the others responded differently, right? They responded with determination. They did not respond with, with discouragement. Now, let's go back a little bit. Bear with me. Let's go revisit their visit, review their visit to Pisidia. They traveled there as part of the journey to fulfill the Great Commission. How far did they travel from their last stop? 150 miles. Thank you very much. Again, think about it. Walking from about here to the outskirts of Boston, the New Balance factory on, that high, on the turnpike going in, that's about that distance, right? They get there. This is great, right? So we've got a mission. Let's go. They get there, and they're really well received, right? They think they're going to have to convince people, but no, people are like, whoa, come in. Tell us the story. It's great. Where they are invited to encourage the Jews in attendance, they do so, and their message doesn't just recount God's promise to the Jews. They go well beyond that and talk about the salvation that comes from Christ. And this message... The Jews in attendance received joyfully, begging them to return the following week to tell it again. That has got to be an amazing result, right? You go in, think about it. You're a salesman. That's, you're going door to door. You walk into one house, right? You, Avon. You, know, you walk into one house. The owner loves what you're selling so much she invites you back next week and has a party, brings all her friends in. I mean, I was in sales. Folks, this didn't happen to me very often. It's a pretty awesome feeling, right? You come back, but for some reason, things are now a little different. Your host is looking at you a little funny. Almost everyone in the city has shown up. The Jews and the Gentiles both, and the Jews... They're not happy about it. They get jealous and they start to oppose you. The same people who supported you start to contradict you. And the very same message they've received with joy the week before, they now reject. To some, that would have been enough to discourage you. Right? It's like, well, hang on, I thought, I thought we were friends. I thought you liked what I... Oh, you don't. Oh. To some, that discouragement would be sufficient to give up, but not to Paul and Barnabas, who in the face of the Jews' reduction said, oh, you don't want this? I'm going to give it to somebody else. I'm going to turn to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles received this message joyfully. Now, if the story had ended there, it would be a great outcome, right? Paul and Barnabas are rewarded for their perseverance, right? Great result. But no, it doesn't. The Jews see that this spread of the Lord's word is still going on throughout the region, and they double down. They double down on the efforts to stop the spread. Look at what they do. Look at how, how the, the lengths to which they will go. There are devout women in Pisidia. It's presumably good people. There are leading men. These are presumably people of goodwill, and they subvert them. Right? They incite devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city and stir up persecution of Paul and Barnabas, driving them out of the district. Folks, I am reminded of, you know, it's easy to think that this happened over almost two, two, over 2,000 years ago, but you just have to look in the press today. As a side note, this is happening today. You know, it's very tough to go on a college campus, for example, and preach gospel. Right? Your, your stuff gets appended, you get chased off of the campus, you need security to get out safely. 
And so this is still happening today. This is a lesson that we can take today. So think about that for a second. Think about that for a second. The Jews chased them out because they, did, they were jealous. They did not like that this message was for everyone. Now, at this point, the rejection has more than doubled, right? Not only have you been like rejected, you've been kicked out. Again, if Paul and Barnabas had at this point thrown their hands up in the air and said, that's it, enough, could we blame them? Probably not. You know, I suspect I would have been tempted to give up a long time before, right? But they did not. They did not give up. They were not discouraged. If anything, their resolve was strengthened. Their determination doubled. And after this, they proceed to Iconium to continue with the Great Commission. So there are three groups, right? And they each responded differently to the encouragement they got from Jesus. Now, let me ask you a question for you to answer for yourselves. Who are you in the story? And who do you want to be? I can tell you this much. I have been the Jewish leadership. I confess. There are many times in my life I've heard the encouragement of salvation through Christ and rejected it for some ridiculous reason. I was busy with work. It was going to get in the way of my social life. It was going to take up too much time or effort. There were other things I wanted to do. Can't I just sleep in on a Sunday morning? There has been, and I admit before you, there still is a lot of that in my life. There have also been times where I've been the Gentiles in this story. I've heard the story of Christ's atoning sacrifice and I've received it with joy. But that knowledge of what he'd done at that point created little change in me. Now, who I'd really like to be, and I say this a bit fearfully if I'm being perfectly honest, is like Paul and Barnabas who embraced the Great Commission and made it their lives who in the face of opposition and rejection, because they knew their purpose, because they found encouragement in their relationship with Christ, had the strength and the fortitude to keep on going. The question is, how do we become like Paul and Barnabas? Now, I looked into it. We know little about Barnabas' con conversion to Christ, but we know a lot more about Paul. And his conversion wasn't easy. Simply put, Paul encountered Jesus. He met Jesus in ways he could not deny. You remember the story. He met Jesus in ways he could not reject. He had no choice. He'd gone blind. He met Jesus in ways that painfully stripped him, painfully stripped him, of anything else that might have been important to him. Think about it. He was on his way to Damascus with authority and power to persecute Christians. He was stripped of his status as a Pharisee, his privilege as a Roman citizen, even his lucrative trade as a tent maker. None of that mattered when he went blind. Right. What changed Paul? Well, he met and he got to know Jesus. He got to know Jesus so well that Jesus became his way, his truth, and his life. And when he hit a brick wall, Jesus was his encouragement. And that's why he could keep on going. So it comes down to this. Right? We are flawed. And when things get tough, we cannot rightly be the source of encouragement that keeps us going. Our encouragement rightly comes only from God. That encouragement is his love, manifest in the salvation we have in Jesus. And so how do we get to that encouragement? We get to know Jesus. And lastly, how do we do that? Well, folks, first we have to acknowledge him. You don't get to know somebody until you acknowledge their presence, right? We have to acknowledge him and then we have to recognize who he is. We have to receive him as our Lord and Savior. And I ask you, have you? And if you haven't and if you have questions, please come and talk to me or to Chad or Tom when he gets back or any one of the many brothers and sisters here who have confessed Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Yeah. There are people here who will testify to that. Now once you have, once you've gotten that introduction to Jesus, so to speak, then get to know Him. Get to know Him really well. Spend time with Him in Scripture. That's where so many people get to hear Him speak for the first time. 
Then spend time to him, with him in prayer, which we talked about earlier, because that's where so many get to talk to him. Get to know him in worship. Get to know him through others. Others, this is really important. Are you part of a community group? And if not, why aren't you? A group of people who gather weekly to get to know Jesus more, that sounds like a good place to be. It's a wonderful place to grow your intimacy with our Savior. The bottom line, however you can, if you want the encouragement to go on amidst the trial, the opposition that you will face in this life, get to know Jesus. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you that, that you allow us to get to know you. We thank you that you are our way, our truth, and our life. We thank you that though the world brings troubles, we can take heart because you have overcome the world. Lord, when we struggle, when we are worried, when we are afraid, when we are tempted to give up, speak to us. Speak to us clearly. Speak to us through friends, through family. Speak to us however you can so that we might be encouraged by your love and that we might persist for your glory. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.